Good evening. Uh, welcome. Um, this is a uh, the webinar hosted by myself, Mr. Abuchi Okara, and Ahmed Hamuda, who are consultant upper GI laparoscopic and bariatric surgeons. So we'd like to welcome you to this webinar that is really going to try and in the next sort of 45 minutes or so really go through a very common problem, heartburn uh, and acid reflux, and see really where we are with our understanding and of course options, but also most importantly, you know, where or how we can help uh, in terms of the help and the symptoms and of course treatment. So a little bit about who we are. Um, Mr. Ahmed Hamuda is uh, a PGI and bariatric surgeon. As I said, he's, uh, these are some of his uh, qualifications. I think most importantly, I think to say between him and I, we have uh, been in uh, consultant roles now for over 15 years. So combined 30 years of really expert consultant independent practice. And I think that's really very important, particularly in the field such as upper GI or certainly reflux disease, because there is a lot that hinges a lot on expertise. And of course, that's more specific type of practice that really can only be built up. So Mr. Hamoudis uh, and I, I'm also very much a mirror uh, in terms of specialty with him. And we are hopefully going to be able to provide you with some insights, um, some education, information, and possibly some assistance uh, where, where, where if possible. So let's go right through. So what are we going to cover today now? Gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn or GERD, all synonymous, is a really common problem, uh, really, very common indeed. Um, now, it is important in today, we're going to discuss in the context of an isolated reflux problem or heartburn problem, but it must be mentioned that sometimes it can be part of uh, a problem that involves the whole of the gastrointestinal tract, such as irritable bowel uh, or functional bowel cut, gut conditions other than the irritable bowel. So, but we're specifically going to look at it as an isolated problem in terms of symptoms. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to give some definition, a bit of history, I think is it worth then treatment options. And I think certainly from our point, surgery, we would finish with that. And then of course, questions and answers will follow that. So that's really what we're going to try and cover uh, this evening. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, as I said, is a chronic condition. It really affects the stomach and the esophagus. Uh, and it's understood uh, really to be as a result of acid or and or bile coming up into the esophagus, which is the gullet, and it staying around for at least over five or six sort of 10 minutes to cause the irritation. And I say five to 10 minutes because actually reflux is something that happens generally in most normal situations, but it's the, the sort of the frequency or indeed the duration that actually makes reflux sometimes a problem. So patients obviously experience it either when there's a bit of a, a problem with the, uh, the valve, which is the barrier, or a hiatus hernia, and symptoms are classically heartburn. So you feel that burning uh, sensation at the back of your breastbone, chest. Some people feel it coming up towards their neck and some people in their ears, uh, and also some people, uh, some patients at the back between their shoulder blades. So it does come in a variety of different uh, symptom uh, patterns. Uh, but the important thing is obviously to note that you, or you will note that staying upright can ease and lying flat or after meals can make it uh, worse. Now, there are sometimes that reflux or GERD can give you some rather atypical symptoms like chest pain. And there are a lot of patients do end up going to uh, see their uh, cardiologists worried about maybe possibly something wrong with the heart or the lungs and it's not particularly unusual for it to be considered possibly a heart attack type symptom because it can actually even lead, get to the left arm but that isn't indeed the mo more common uh... some patients get a lot of belching uh, a lot of nausea can also be a symptom and in the cases that have not just acid but what we call volume reflux or quantity reflux you do find regurgitation so when you belch or burp 
you sometimes find suddenly your mouth is full of maybe fluid or saliva or uh, stuff you'd eaten before. And that can be quite un uh, uh, uncomfortable. And particularly at night, if you're lying flat, occasionally coughing can happen in the middle of the night and you end up with this, what we call aspiration sort of uh, um, pneumonia. So these broad range of how the reflux or GERD can present. Now, unfortunately, uh, in maybe untreated cases or uh, when it's persistent, then you can get complications like inflammation, like esophagitis, which is really where the tissues are now getting angry. Um, you, that makes usually the pain more persistent, particularly gnawing and sometimes actually really feeling like a burn uh, and patients do end up having a lot of gaviscon or milk. So that's really where things can get into, uh, into difficulty. And then of course, unfortunately, scarring can occur. And on the rare occasion uh, or less common is where you get Barrett's, which is quite serious. Uh, it is worth mentioning that of course, you really have to have had reflux very bad for quite some time to get Barrett's, uh, which is where the esophagus becomes more or less a stomach and the cells unfortunately can get a little bit unstable and sometimes lead to cancer, uh, which we're not going to talk a lot about today because it isn't a very common complication, but it is worth mentioning it. What clearly are the risk factors? Of course, anybody that's obviously suffering from uh, suspected or confirmed uh, reflux or GERD will always think, what can I do uh, to make things better? What are the things I'm doing that are making it worse? And this is really very, very important makes sense if you are overweight and there's a lot of pressure in your uh, abdomen then of course the pressure can actually create that uh, push up of the reflux or the acid or the bile smoking clearly uh, a risk factor having a hiatus hernia which we will touch on a bit later in this presentation because of the importance real importance of a hiatus hernia uh, which is really a hernia as we know it but more around the diaphragm and its linkage with reflux, and that really requires special attention. Uh, so we will talk about that a little bit later. Of course, certain medications, uh, understandably, uh, can cause it. Um, and of course, the important thing always with reflux, most times is actually, is it reflux or is it something else? And I think diagnosis is uh, still, I think sometimes a concern, some patients, uh, always worried is it reflux and if it is are they getting any damage and I think when we look at a diagnosis uh, then normally the story can tell a lot but occasionally we have to do cameras and sometimes we have to do dye tests and sometimes we have to look at acid levels in the esophagus. Um, we may touch on a little bit later uh, the relevance of that because proving reflux with any shadow of doubt is absolutely critical if you're ever beginning to move in the trajectory of surgery because there is no uh, way that anything operative or surgical can be done if we are not certain that we're dealing with reflux. And, you know, because it's a common problem, of course, we don't want it to be mimicked or masquerading as another problem. So that's really very important to have a diagnosis confirmed. And that's why sometimes we have to actually measure the acid in the esophagus. So, yes, hi, Turnia. Now, some of you may or may not have had a diagnosis of a hiatus hernia, but essentially it's where the diaphragm, the hole that is present in the diaphragm naturally as part of the way the body has been created or designed uh, is wider. It's wider than it should be. Unfortunately, that means that the stomach upper portion can move up and down into the chest. And that is uh, unfortunately where reflux can be uh, precipitated or can be caused by that simple change in pressure or change in position of the stomach uh, and the esophagus, which is a hiatus hernia. And, and that is probably linked with a GERD or reflux, probably in about more than 40 to 50% of cases. And so it is important. Uh, now, how do you make the diagnosis? Uh, with an endoscopy uh, in most instances, but occasionally uh, it can be picked up on a chest X-ray or uh, a body scan, a CT scan or MRI scan. So it could be more of an incidental finding. But most times in clinic, 
with an endoscopy, it's quite simple to, to, to pick it up using an endoscopy, which is a camera into the mouth, looking down uh, into uh, the stomach uh, and the gullet. And this is just an example here on this image that just shows uh, what the hiatus hernia looks like. The diaphragm, uh, you can see, uh, I don't know, yeah, the cursor, this is really the hole in the diaphragm, which is quite wide. This is the heart in the top here uh, and the liver over here. And you can see the stomach has actually gone quite high up. And this is a problem. And this would potentially be uh, what we would call a predisposing factor to uh, reflux disease. So really going back to uh, more or less the, the complications of reflux uh, and, or GERD. And, and I've mentioned them earlier, but I think we'll just go back to them again. When there's inflammation, which is soreness or redness uh, or irritation, then that can cause uh, damage to the esophagus. And that usually is picked up with an endoscopy as you look down. You'll see the redness, you'll see maybe some uh, what we call erosions or some scarring. Um, and that is very much diagnostic of reflux or GERD, very diagnostic, frankly. You see that, you know that there is something that is irritating the lower part of the esophagus. Now, unfortunately, this is not treated or if it persists for a very long time. As we all know, when the body heals, you tend to get scar tissue and that scar tissue can lead to narrowing or strictures, uh, which we call uh, peptic or benign strictures. Now, they do cause blockage on occasion and you might, or patients may experience difficulty swallowing certain things like solid foods like bread or, uh, or meat. Um, now, the good news is that it, they are not the commonest causes of narrowing or uh, stricturing of the esophagus, it must be said, but they are on can occur. As I highlighted earlier, Barrett's uh, is a condition where there is a, uh, a very abnormal change in the lining of the esophagus, usually as a, as a result of long standing reflux, untreated particularly, uh, and that is a serious condition, uh, partly because it can on occasion lead to cancer of the gullet or esophagus. So we take that very seriously indeed. But as I mentioned earlier, it is not a common or frequent complication of reflux that we see in usual instances. So it's certainly not something I, we like to maybe scare patients about because it is certainly a rarity when it comes to overall reflux that we see in the population. As I mentioned uh, earlier, cancer can obviously be a problem and it's normally linked directly with reflux when it comes to GERD or reflux disease. On occasion, uh, reflux can cause hoarseness horn of the voice. Uh, partly because, of course, as the acid lifts up or the, into the esophagus, uh, it goes higher into the neck and can trickle down into the voice box. Uh, and you do occasionally find certainly, uh, you know, individuals who uh, maybe are singers, uh, they can get uh, problems of low tone or uh, loss of voice function. Uh, and that can be a bit of a problem when it comes to career. So, yes. Problems with the voice box can occur in reflux and, and hoarseness is uh, a recognized uh, um, type of symptom of reflux disease. As I did highlight and mentioned earlier, on occasion the, 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 you can get it in the lung and then get pneumonias, but that again isn't very particularly common, uh, but can occur. As I highlighted, it is a common problem. Reflux affects pretty much most of us, all of us at some point, uh, and a lot of us have seasonal reflux or, uh, you know, maybe uh, a curry or a few, uh, a few, a few beer beers and you, you get a bit of reflux overnight. So it is quite common. I think it's where it is persistent that I think a lot of patients find it uncomfortable. Certainly when it interferes with quality of life, where you pretty much can't eat anything apart from bland types of foods, uh, then clearly that is something that needs attention. The problem was picked up actually way back uh, with, by a gastroenterologist um, in 1925, and it was at the time linked with a high hernia, which again we mentioned earlier, and that is extremely important to, to make that connection. Now, the relevance of this is that reflux 
is really been around for a while in terms of diagnosis. It is part of the human condition, you could say. But I agree, it shouldn't interfere with consistent quality of life. And of course, we always like to start to get to uh, have the chance to treat patients if they feel their quality of life, particularly when it comes to choice of foods and drinks and just general uh, well-being and being affected by this uh, problem. Which kind of swiftly brings us on to treatment. So how do we treat reflux? Now, I've mentioned a lot about how food and lifestyle kind of, are kind of affected really. And that makes sense that actually changes to diet, particularly what we eat, when we eat, how much we eat, of course, is critical in the management of reflux disease. Absolutely a cornerstone. So we really emphasize the importance of looking very, very carefully at your diet and lifestyle because they, you can make some significant inroads in treatment just by simply adjusting the diet and things like lifestyle, such as bringing the foot of the bed, bringing the head of the bed up. Some people sometimes have to put things like blocks to get it right up. Uh, going to bed with a stomach that is empty, which means last meal maybe five, six, and then sleeping at around nine, ten maybe. Pillows help. Certainly losing weight. Absolutely important to try and lose some weight to reduce the pressure. And, and, and measures like that certainly can help. Of course, stopping smoking if you have to indulge in, uh, in tobacco. So that really can make a big difference. Now, for the patients that that doesn't work for, then of course there are things to add on to that, which would always things like maybe antacids, which would be the gaviscons and so on, using uh, omeprazole or one of the other proton pump uh, inhibitor drugs, which are, do need prescription mostly, but are very effective indeed. And it is worth mentioning here now that they can be used in the long term, uh, long term being over a period of five or 10 years. And a lot of the scare or a lot of the press reports of problems with proton pump inhibitors or acid suppression long term uh, is really, uh, as far as I'm aware, data from about use over 20 years. And you get thinning of the bones uh, and so on. So we're looking at short term use, three, five, so years. I, at the moment, don't think it's a reason not to try at least to use these to control symptoms. You can sometimes use things that help to push the stomach uh, content out, which we call prokinetics. But again, not a significant number of patients do need to go uh, and use these uh, extra drugs. Now, of course, uh, what are the foods that uh, do come up as, uh, as sort of culprits, as it, as it were? Now, the important thing to say is that processed foods generally are a problem. And they would be fried, of course, fast foods, pizzas, all the kind of foods that we uh, uh, can easily get our hands on. Uh, but it is worth being very careful, of course, if you are prone to reflux, uh, to really pay attention to that. Now, unfortunately, some other foods are really tomato-based, of course, citrus, we know, Chocolate, hmm, hard one, very, you know, we all like a little bit of chocolate, but of course, certainly if you know that you're finding that these precipitated, then it is important to consider at least reducing them or indeed eliminating them uh, from the diet. Now, of course, it's important to mention they are good foods, apparently, that can particularly help. And these are fiber foods, uh, which I've listed a few here. Alkaline foods um, also can be useful. Um, and certainly home remedies. So these are things that uh, uh, definitely there's evidence to show that they can be really helpful. And without a doubt, I think a combination of different things is usually found to be more, more beneficial uh, in kind of getting things un under control to allow at least ability to sleep at night, particularly ability to obviously make better choice of meals uh, and improve quality of life. So I'm gonna, if, if it's okay with everybody, go on to really surgery. So let's say you tried all the medical things and you know, the, the life quality, the uh, you know, kind of concern is that your or patients really concerned that they don't feel that, or they don't want to have uh, uh, medical therapy permanently, then really we have to give consideration to surgery. And that's really where we come in in the, in the care or the management basically, because of course as surgeons, we would really only 
be looking at managing in a slightly larger uh, sort of sense patients who are either keen or good candidates for surgery. And the operation that uh, really we tend to go for, which is the gold standard, I would say, is what they call the laparoscopic uh, fundoplication. Um, you know, and then with your surgeon, for example, the, the discussion is whether it's a complete wrap, which means 360 degrees or a partial wrap, which wouldn't get too technical as, as far as the purpose of discussion today is, but the point is surgery uh, in the right patient, uh, obviously with the right preparation uh, can make quite a difference um, to experience a life quality of life and of course uh, reduce reflux. So a little bit about the history, the operation itself <clears throat> was first performed in 1955, so it's been around for quite some time. Um, it's got some different names, of course, but I think the most important thing to say is that it really became very popular in the 70s and more so in the 80s and 90s when keyhole surgery came about. And I think that's really why the Nissen, if you're looking at operations in history that have stood the test of time, this is an operation that has stood the test of time. Um, which uh, is good because it's actually some a procedure that is actually technically quite easy to do, uh, but does require a level of skill and precision in order to make sure that it's done in the way that will give a good chance of success. Now, of course, it's an operation and there indeed there are complications. There are certainly side effects which cannot be ignored, um, you know, when it comes to... Um, you know, a procedure, of course, but the most important thing to say that the patients that are best suited to have surgery are usually patients uh -huh, who probably have long-standing reflux, possibly uh, medical therapy hasn't worked for. If the high titania is quite large, uh, we do find that you can get uh, better treatment uh, with surgery. And uh, certainly patients who get what we call volume reflux. So when they either stoop down or lie down, they get not just acid uh, but they get you know fluid and volume coming up um, because that valve is just gone usually can benefit from uh, an, an operation so technically what does the operation involve now it's in two parts uh, really if you think about it from a technical point of view if you recall i did mention uh, earlier that uh, the diaphragm had a bit of a wide opening or it was uh, uh, sort of uh, elongated, we would always narrow that. So that's the set, first part of the operation. And the second part is just to do what we call the funder, which is the wrap. So we are wrapping uh, the upper stomach around the esophagus and then anchoring it. And I have a few um, uh, images that might help to explain what it involves. And that's really what the operation involves, two uh, technical components. As I mentioned earlier, it's been done keyhole. The good news is that patients uh, could either go home uh, if we most times the following morning, the following day, but occasionally the same day. The pain levels are very low indeed, which I think really makes it quite uh, acceptable. There's no need for anything strong like morphine after the surgery. Uh, patients are able to get drink uh, quite quick and get up and about and pretty much back into the office, back into work within about sort of 10 days-ish, as it were. So, and I think that's why it's quite uh, really well sort of accepted really, or welcomed, I think, when it comes to a procedure that is, uh, can revolutionize care and make patients really experience lower and reduced amounts of, uh, of symptoms. So here we are. So these are the, uh, the sort of the, uh, the illustrations really. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, really the, the diaphragm the diaphragm is, is the sling, which is where we put a few stitches in the diaphragm. We then use some stitches to create this wrap, which is really where we free up the upper stomach and we wrap it below and around the esophagus uh, to, uh, to create a snug, it's not tight, it's a very snug, uh, well-positioned um, uh, um, sort of uh, spiral uh, suture and uh, anchoring around the esophagus uh, that allows the stomach to essentially uh, stop allowing contents to go up into the gullet. And that's still the fundamental way it works. 
So basically what happens is as the, the, the esophagus closes, as the stomach obviously raises its pressure, in which case bile or acid or whatever can't go back up. Uh, and that's really how it works. Uh, so those are the two components of the, uh, the Nissen uh, fundo. And of course, the other uh, component is that it does create a slightly high pressure area in the lower esophagus. So of course, the question is, how effective is it? Uh, and the most important thing is that it's got a very low risk of complication. And that is important. Um, it's performed on patients who are generally otherwise well, so we don't want to get patients getting into difficulty or having a lot of uncertainty around whether they're going to have a complication after the surgery. And that's why, again, surgeons who operate on that part of the body, of course, because of all the kind of critical structures, of course, have to have a very firm uh, and very sort of balanced uh, eye and hand to do, to do the work. And that's why the results remain very good when it comes to technical uh, problems. Um, in terms of impact on reducing reflux, a lot of the studies are saying that patients really get about 80% benefits, thereby 80, maybe 70, 80%, uh, and occasionally up to 90 when it comes to quality of life, reduced symptoms, and, and it is sustainable. Some studies quote 10% recurrence at about five to 10 years. Um, and occasionally there's some that have to go for second surgery. So as far as I think the track record of the operation um, in terms of the longevity of it, I think it still stands a very, very stands up very well against any of the more recent or more um, newer procedures, which we may touch on today. So Nissen is still the gold standard operation uh, for this uh, for the treatment of reflux. There are certainly some complications. Absolutely, there are some side effects of complications. I probably call them more side effects. Um, and that really is the fact that it's part and parcel of what we've done is the side effect that you can get bloated, you don't belch as much, you don't, <clears throat> you don't always fall, find, find it easy to release the gas, uh, which causes the bloating. There is uh, evidence, of course, it happens obviously a little bit earlier, of course, in the beginning and after about two, three, four months, there is some improvement generally, but gas bloat uh, usually can be self-limiting. I certainly find that. Now, what we do advise is that patients must be very careful to avoid any gassy um, drinks, fizzy drinks, possibly. Uh, try not to swallow a lot of air. And there's certain things to try and cut down. On the very rare occasion, it becomes really irritating or debilitating. Then of course we can use things like charcoal, uh, peppermint teas and, and so on to try and make, make things more comfortable. Difficulty swallowing, understandably, uh, is something you always expect after this surgery. And I think one of the reasons is the swelling after any procedure. Now, it's very important to mention uh, that certainly after any fundoplication uh, procedure, we would always recommend liquid uh, to softy diet for about three to four weeks just to minimize the difficulty that you would expect uh, as food uh, passes down where the diaphragm has been uh, stitched. And that's very important to say. So we do recommend uh, soft diets. Now, the good news is that most of the patients that have that difficulty over the course of eight, 12 weeks, it kind of settles. Uh, the thing we can't, uh, we don't want patients to ever really go through after this type of operation is vomiting. So we really do everything we can to minimize um, the chance of that with drugs, but also what patients are allowed to drink and eat. But overall, the bad difficulty swallowing does not occur commonly, I think, particularly in surgeons or in practices that are, are able to get a really good gauge of how tight and how snug to make things, I should say. There's some rarer complications or side effects that can occur. Uh, the vagus nerve was, was damaged, for example, then you may get some dumping, again, diarrhea, and th these are rare, must be said. I think the ones that certainly we would always make very important mention would be the gas bloat, uh, increased passage of wind from the bottom as a consequence of not being able to belch, uh, and the difficulty with swallowing, uh, and the need to obviously chew your food up very much. So a lot of mastication, it's got to go there to really break the food down and make sure it's moist. Um, certainly in the first three months is key and not to rush foods uh, so that you don't get any 
through sticking. That's very important after this surgery. So we're coming probably towards the last few slides here now. Now I've got to mention the procedure that some of you may have heard of called the LYNX. Um, the LYNX procedure, and there will be a, a, an illustration or diagram of it, is, uh, is, is a very uh, new procedure in terms of uh, coming and sitting quite next to the fundoplication. Uh, in you know, it's 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 very cut, cutting edge. We're using they use a, a bead or a series of magnetic beads, and they and it's and they're positioned at the lower end of the uh, esophagus, pretty much to mimic a valve, pretty much. Um, and so it's quite effective in that respect. Now the only slight issues, unfortunately, is that this link the links procedure. Um, can only there's quite a lot of restrictions on who can have it to a degree. If you've got a big hydrocele, it can't be used. If you've got Barrett's or if you've got any bad esophagitis, then it's something that shouldn't really be used. And of course, if you are going to possibly have an MRI, because you can't really, it's not MRI compatible. But apart from that, Lynx has gained a little bit of popularity, mostly because of the the fact patient patients can belch. Uh, you know, after at least belch more than if, if they had a fundo, but they still are difficulty swallowing problems, vomiting, this nausea. So there are still some uh, recognized side effects. So it isn't exactly without any side effects like any uh, operation. And here's a diagram of it essentially. So, <clears throat> so it is. It's a magnetic ring. Uh, it's 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 basically uh, calibrated at the time of the surgery using a special calibration device. And then the beads or the rings are placed in accordance to uh, the size or the aperture of, of that uh, space for that particular patient and then deployed and anchored. Um, and I think the key here is that it has a way of letting food in or letting material pass it by relaxing and then opening up later on if you need a belch and releasing. So it, it, that's really how it works. We don't offer that, I must say, uh, it is not the procedure that we offer, uh, but it's not, it's probably one or two centers around Kent that offer it, but we don't offer it. Better. I think I'm coming towards the, the end, really. So, just to sort of close with a few uh, important extra components to mention one, there are uh, other devices that can be used to treat reflux, uh, such as what we call the Stretter, which is uh, using electrodes to uh, create a bit of swelling at the lower end of the esophagus. Um, not that common, I must say, not that popular overall. Um, some of the other procedures that were brought out have actually gone off in popularity. So really, I think we really stand with the core treatment being lifestyle uh, uh, modification, diet modification, and of course, drugs like omeprazole, really effective. And then for the patients that come through that and don't uh, actually get a good response, and you sh you certainly can then start look at things like procedures like fundoplication. So, to summarize. Um, thank you all, obviously, for making time to attend. I hope you found this useful. Um, reflux is common, indeed. Um, using non-operative management strategies is really effective and is a cornerstone. But on occasion, of course, surgery can be used and it can be extremely effective for the right patient with very good outcomes uh, and low chance of morbidity or mortality. And yes, I'll be handing over to my colleague, uh, Ahmed Hamouda, for questions, sessions, and uh, I'd like to thank you once again for, uh, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Caro. Um, I think Morella is going to uh, take us through some questions that she has. I have. Thank you, Mr. Hamuda and Mr. Akaro. So we have some questions for you. So um, the first one is, um, I don't have any symptoms of reflux, except that I have what feels like constant phlegm in my throat. I have all sorts of treatments, but nothing has worked. I'm on 40 um, a day of omeprazole. Sorry if I haven't uh, pronounced that correctly. I don't smoke, not overweight. I've had this for about four years with no reasons apart from my doctor thinks it is reflux. Thank you very much for the question. 
Um, and I would like to say that obviously with Mr. Akaro and the comprehensive review that he's done of this subject uh, has been very, very useful, very informative. Um, and sort of linking back to what he said, the symptoms can be very, very typical. So where you get chest pain and classic heartburn, there's burning behind the chest plate and it comes back up into your throat with a bit of regurgitation or volume reflux. That can be quite a typical presentation. But there are certain circumstances where there are symptoms that are very atypical, such as phlegm, for example, or spluttering or cough or erosion of teeth. And some people will have gone to see different specialists, an ENT specialist, for example, first, or they've gone to see the dentist. And after exhausting all the different paths to a diagnosis, someone will say, well, actually, have you thought of reflux? Could this be reflux? Could it be that there's an excessive amount of acid coming up into your gullet? And that's why it's quite difficult to make a diagnosis in certain selected cases. And that's why, again, going back to what Mr. Ocaro said, when you come and see us, we've got the comprehensive service that allows us to go in with a camera, have a look inside your gullet, and see whether there's any evidence of acid burn to the lower end of your gullet, esophagitis, which he described as being quite typical in diagnosing an acid reflux problem. So that would be the first thing that we look at. And then the second thing that's really important to support our endoscopy findings would be a, a diagnostic test to see how much acid is actually coming up into the gullet. And if there is an excessive amount of acid coming up into the gullet on a pH, uh, uh, on a pH test, then obviously that is more diagnostic. But I would have to say that sometimes at the end of our tests, we turn around and say, we really can't find evidence that acid is the problem here. And it could be that your gullet is hypersensitive. There's a very small amount of acid that's coming up into it, but your gullet is just very sensitive to it and this, therefore you get the symptoms. Or let's revisit again some of the other specialties. Could be a chest physician that needs to look after you. Maybe the phlegm is caused by you know, an ongoing bronchiectasis or a condition of, of the lungs that could be uh, contributing to this, uh, to this matter. So that's why it's really useful to come to a comprehensive service like ours, where we can offer all the diagnostics. We can give you a diagnosis and then we can start treatments. We can advise you whether or not an operation such as a fund application will help resolve your symptoms. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Donna. Um, I have been on PPIs for 30 years and have hypermobile EDS. What would, what would help me please? So again, I think going back to what I said previously and what Mr. Okara has been alluding to is that, has a diagnosis been made? Have we gone in with an endoscopy? Have we looked at the lower end of your gullet? Have we made a diagnosis of a heights hernia, esophagitis, or possibly even Barrett's? And is there some evidence that would support us doing a pH test to test for how much acid is coming up into your gullet? Hypermobile EDS, yes, I mean, there is joint weakness. There could be an element that, that's contri contributory to reflux. However, it, it won't be the clinching uh, diagnosis here. What we need to do is have a look, and that is an endoscopy, a pH test, come and see the specialist. Mr. Carr, is there anything that you would add to that at all? Uh, not at all. Uh, I, think you, I, think, I think it's absolutely... Um, absolutely important, as you say, to, to firm up a diagnosis. And I think um, endoscopy is a very straightforward, uh, simple tool, but it can shed a lot of light, particularly with regard to the lower end of the esophagus uh, and what may well be going on in the lower end of the esophagus. So yes, absolutely. I think uh, you're absolutely right. I agree that we really need to see and then have advice. Lovely, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next question is from Claire. Um, I have GERD and a, and a hiatus hernia and div diverticulum, sorry, um, again. Um, this has occurred since my gastric sleeve in 2018. Would Nissan, would Nissan the surgery help me? So a bit more complex, obviously, and interesting, uh, the situation that, that we're presented with. Having had a gastric sleeve means that you have lost the fundus of the stomach, the floppy bit of the stomach that Mr. Okara was describing, that is essential for us to do the operation because that's the bit of stomach that wraps around the lower end of the gullet in this operation and recreates the valve-like effect that prevents acid from coming up. 
So I would have to say that you would need to come and see us for a specialist opinion. Um, and it's very likely that to treat reflux and even a high hernia, depending on what the size of it, in this situation, we may need to look at even, you know, things like doing a mini bypass or a bypass procedure. Um, because without the fundus of the stomach, we really don't have anything to wrap around the lower end of the gullet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next question is from Rosemary. Can links be used with a pacemaker? Uh, I will ask Mr. Caro, perhaps, to answer that question. Uh, I don't know, actually. I mean, I suspect, uh, yes, but I don't actually know that for certainty, really. Um, I mean, you know, thinking about it, there shouldn't be any reason why not. I mean, the only thing with pacemakers, of course, is obviously electrical activity coming from, uh, from sort of diathermies and other devices. So I think for the top of my head, I would say uh, I can't see why not. But I think, of course, we don't offer the service. So I would definitely make a recommendation to maybe inquire with one of the other centres uh, in London or thereabouts that do offer it to maybe ask them directly. Uh, I'm sorry, we haven't. Can't give any certain answer there. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple more anonymous questions I have in front of me. Um, so I'm a woman in my 40s who suffers frequently from symptoms such as heartburn, regurgitation, and breathing problems. The latter may be caused by my asthma. How would you diagnose if what I'm struggling with is gourd? Again, this really is going back to the presentation, going back to the information that we uh, we talked about. Gourd is one of those things that can be very easy to diagnose. If it's classical heartburn, it is related to something that you eat that's quite obvious, a spicy meal, a curry, uh, having some wine uh, at an evening where after that you develop classical chest burn or burning behind the chest plate, and it's very easy to diagnose. And there will be instances where it is more difficult because the symptoms are not typical. And I'd have to say that there is a substantial amount of people that actually have atypical symptoms. So going back to getting the appropriate support within a comprehensive service where you have consultants that have been dealing with this for years and years, but also all the diagnostics based at the same place and a multidisciplinary approach. So not just myself and Mr. O'Carroll within the team, but also gastroenterology colleagues, physicians who deal with this on a daily basis. And what would happen is you would come and see us and we would start off by doing an endoscopy looking at the lower end of your gullet, making a diagnosis, and then moving on swiftly to a pH test where we test how much acid comes up into the gullet. And I would have to say that without those tests, it's very difficult to tell, just purely based on symptoms. Um, and therefore, I would encourage you to make an appointment to come and see us if you really wanted to look into this further. Thank you very much. Um, I researched lifestyle changes, which I thought would help improve my acid reflux. I lost a bit of weight, didn't eat late at night. I'm a non-smoker and I've been trying to sleep on my left side, but none of this has made a big difference. Would you recommend medication for me or surgery? It's very interesting. Again, the question of course, uh, relates to whether or not you have acid reflux and, and uh, GERD or GORD. Uh, and of course, one of the things that happens on a daily basis is that people presenting to their GPs tend to, with the symptoms that you describe, get a trial of PPIs, omeprazole or lanzoprazole, otherwise known as acid suppression medication, uh, for a period of anywhere between six weeks to two, three months to see whether it helps their symptoms. And that's usually the normal way that people will get a medication or a diagnosis. Now, if the medication is given without having an endoscopy to look at the lower end of your gullet, we are really treating you blind or empirically. And I would suggest that it would be much better if we were able to, to do a diagnostic test first. And so if you do suffer with symptoms similar to what you've described, it would be much better to come and see us, have a diagnostic test done like an OGD, and then we would be able to advise yes or no regarding the medication, uh, regarding obviously the lifestyle changes that you've made, which are spot on, uh, but whether or not we can then progress things and help with an intervention like a fund application. Thank you very much. Um, next question. Um, I'm currently trying to eat a high fiber diet to help with my symptoms of GERD. After having fund application surgery, would I still need to manage the foods that I eat and follow the lifestyle changes? 
Mr. Carr, would you like to take the question or would you like me to? No, no please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so obviously after, after you've had an operation, things change a bit. Um, there is a tighter, higher pressure zone at the lower end of the gullet. And that in essence means that we, we almost give you what is almost like a gastric band uh, in that area, because we're trying to prevent any acid that's in the stomach from moving up into the gullet. So things will need to change. And what will happen is you'll need to eat little and often. You potentially will need to have very small mouthfuls, chew food very well. There will be instances where there, there might be stuck episodes where you have a piece of meat, for example, and you feel it sticking behind your chest plate. Um, and either wait for it to go through, or you might need some fizzy or, or water to try and, and, and push it through that high pressure zone. Um, when it comes to consistency of food and fiber in, in your food, I don't particularly think that there's any stipulation to change your diet in any way or change the quality of what you're eating. But it's very important to chew food very well, have small mouthfuls, and allow things to go through that high pressure zone um, like, like Mr. Carr described in his, in his uh, diagrams. But I don't think that there is any special diet that you have to follow. And of course, if there is any particular food matters that in the past have made you suffer with the reflux, then perhaps avoiding them would obviously be a good idea after the operation. Thank you very much. Um, is fund application surgery a day case procedure? If so, would I be allowed to drive myself home from the hospital? So two components to that question. First, is it a day case surgery procedure? and will you be able to drive home after an operation? It's easy to answer the second part, which is a, a consistent no. You can never drive yourself home after an operation because you've had a general anesthetic, you're tender and sore from the wounds. It's very possible you might have an episode of vomiting or feel a bit dizzy. So that is a definite no. In terms of doing it as day case, fund applications have been advocated as day surgery cases over the past maybe 10, 15 years. And we tend to aim for approximately 30 to 40% of our patients going home on the same day. Having said that, there is an argument to be made for staying in overnight for this procedure, because we want to get on top of any sickness that may occur, any nausea that may occur. We have the um, access to intravenous fluids, but also painkillers to allow the body to rest and heal. And therefore, I think it is an individual um, judgment to be made um, and consultation with your, your upper GI consultant and the expectations are that yes you may be able to go home on the day if you're fit and healthy and you don't suffer with any of the of the of the things that I said nausea vomiting pain etc but there is also provision for you to spend the night if need be. Thank you very much um, just a couple more questions um, what is the difference in the recovery time from the different treatment options for Gord? I'm a working mum in her late 30s who can't really afford to take too much time off. Well, I, I believe Mr. O'Cara covered this really well in his presentation. He said that, you know, within 10 days after a keyhole operation um, to treat reflux with a fund application, people should be back to normal. So we are talking about potentially driving within a week or so, being able to get back to work within a week to 10 days. I mean, to be honest with you, with most people working from home these days, potentially you could be sitting at your laptop um, two days after the operation doing your work, you know, and getting through loads and loads of stuff. Um, so the keyhole element of this procedure has changed the world. Um, I remember, and I don't know whether Mr. Caro agrees with me, but these operations used to be done through a massive incision through the chest and the abdomen about 40 years ago. I mean, it was an operation that needed to be survived, first of all. Um, and the, the element of changing it into a keyhole operation that can be done as day surgery at the moment with very quick recovery means that it's changed the world for people who, who suffer with reflux. Thank you very much. Um, so last question. Um, I had a gastric sleeve fitted a couple of years ago at Benenden Hospital. Since then, I've reached my goal weight, but I now suffer with a lot of acid reflux. Would I be a suitable patient for fund, fund duplication surgery? Yes, again, going back to what we said previously in answer to the other question, unfortunately, a gastric sleeve means, by definition, we've taken away the fundus of the stomach. We've taken away that floppy, volum voluminous bit of stomach that can be wrapped around the lower end of the gullet. And reflux is one of the known uh, problems that happens with restrictive um, weight loss 
operations, such as a band or a sleeve. So reflux is common after a sleeve. It can and should be treated with medication to start off with. If it becomes problematic, then, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but the only way to, to, to perhaps maybe progress it is to change that sleeve into a mini bypass procedure where the lower end of the stomach, the sleeve is emptied into the bowel quite quickly and without creating a pressure zone within the sleeve or a, a, a ruan while gastric bypass procedure. And again, things, these are things that we do at Benedin. We can offer you the help and the support. Um, and if it's becoming a bit of an issue, your reflux, then please come and see us because we can definitely do something about it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Akaro, Mr. Hamuda, and thank you everybody who asked questions at this evening's webinar. Um, if you would like to book your consultation, please contact us on the number on screen before eight o'clock this evening, alternatively between nine and five, Monday to Friday. You will receive a short survey and we would be grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let me have your feedback on today's webinar. Our next webinar is on the 16th of May with consultant orthopaedic surgeons, Mr. Richard Goddard and Mr. Raman Faku, who will be discussing hip and knee replacement surgery. So on behalf of Mr. Hamuda, Mr. Okaro, myself and the team at Benedon Hospital, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to you joining us again on another webinar very soon. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.